like for example, if you're getting data sets from Kaggle, like open data set, like Titanic data set, I mean, there'd be countless other right. people analyzing the same data set. And so it's good for learning, but then in order to build a portfolio, you want to build it based on unique data set in order to stand unique apart from the other uh, candidate. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is John David, and I'm the host of the How to Get an Analytics Job podcast. Today, we're going to be interviewing Chenin, who is a fellow YouTuber in the data analytics space. He is an associate professor at a university in Thailand, and is also the head of a center that focuses on data mining and bioinformatics. Today, we're going to be focusing on building an analytics portfolio. Here's a rough outline of the structure for today's conversation. Number one, we're going to talk about the importance of an analytics portfolio. Number two, we're going to talk about what projects you should actually include in your analytics portfolio. And finally, number three, we're going to talk about what makes projects an effective piece within your analytics portfolio. If at any point you find value out of this podcast episode, the best thing you can do to give back to us is to leave a like, a share, or a comment on this video. This will help boost our signal out on the algorithm so that our content will get shared with more people. So without further ado, let's start the podcast. My name is Chenin Nantak Senamad, and I'm an associate professor of bioinformatics at a research university in Thailand. And aside from being a professor, I am also a YouTuber on data science at the Data Professor YouTube channel. And aside from that, in my daytime job, I'm also doing research where I'm applying machine learning in order to understand the molecular features of compounds and drugs in order to design a, a more robust, a more better drug. Oh, wow. Cool. So it sounds like you're like super deep into data right now. Like you're all about it. Yeah, very passionate about it. Awesome. So speaking of data, you have quite a lot to say about building a portfolio. So what is the reason that you are advising people to go ahead and build out a portfolio? Right. So that, that's a great question. So actually, I've written prior to our uh, meeting here, I've written some of the key points that I would like to mention. So in my opinion, I believe that a portfolio is a great way to showcase your data science work. Because like, for example, when you're taking courses at the university or you're taking uh, certificates, online courses, um, what you can show to employers is that you have already completed the course. However, it doesn't tell you, it, it doesn't tell the employer anything about your level of mastery of the uh, skills or the, the technicalities of those. So if you're building a portfolio, it will allow you to demonstrate your mastery of the concepts and the algorithms that you're using. And so a portfolio is comprised of essentially a list of projects that you have done on the side, or it could be related to your work if, if your work also allows that. Like for example, in my work, I'm doing research, so I'm accumulating a list of portfolio of projects. And so that could be, and, and normally I would have another GitHub where I share all of the data and code on my GitHub. And I have a separate GitHub for the YouTube channel. And so I could provide the GitHub of my own research uh, group in the description of your uh, channel as well, if anyone is interested. And so what essentially a portfolio has, like, like for example, a portfolio has been quite beneficial to uh, my group in that it allows other people to make use of the code and data so that it will benefit them. They don't have to spend like a whole week or a whole month in order to try to reproduce the work. Because like, for example, one of my PhD students, he's trying to reproduce one of the paper that he read and he spent like two months debugging, trying to make sense of what the, the materials and method is trying to say. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the materials and methods is very clear, then it might mean that some algorithms, I mean, like some important step might be missing from the workflow. And so if you're sharing the code, if the paper is sharing the code, 
it allows the person reading the paper to easily implement the work right away. And in order to, um, I mean, doing that is quite simple, right? Just putting it into your own data science environment, opening it up, run it as a script. And then the, the reader could also make improvements to it as well. And um, I mean, that could e eventually lead to some interesting collaborations between the, the readers and your, yourself who shares the code. And another benefit thing is that uh, potential employers, if you're an aspiring data scientist or potential collaborators could see your work and reach out to you. I mean, that, that's a great way to showcase and also to pay it forward to the data science community. And yeah, so the third point I have here is that a portfolio in academia uh, it's essentially a list of publications or a list of research papers that the person has published. However, in data science and for software engineer, a portfolio would essentially be GitHub. Okay. So actually a couple of years ago, I, I, would, I, I would just realize that. Like as a researcher, you would accumulate research papers in your CV. So a CV could be many pages, like more than two pages. Like a typical resume would be recommended to be less than a page, right? But in academia, a CV would be like, kind of like a collection of your whole research career work, like all of the research talk that you have given, all of the uh, students that you have supervised, all of the research publication that you have published, all the book chapters that you have written. And so it's software engineer or data science, it's essentially a GitHub, right? And one, one of the, one of my colleagues who, who introduced me to GitHub, uh, he was a former research assistant in our group. And he also introduced me to the Python language. It was like back in, I think it was like 2010. Yeah, so so back at the time, I, I kind of dabbled with Python. And it took me quite some time in order to break into using Python in my work. So I, I started off as kind of like hiring a research assistant to help code in Python and slowly learn from uh, the research assistant. And so that took a couple of years actually, because uh, like coming from a non-technical background, trying to understand concepts in computer science was quite a big hurdle for me. And over time that, that came, became a bit easier. And interesting. So yeah, I am not at <clears throat> all. Well, I mean, I, it's funny cause I'm, I'm an adjunct professor or faculty member, I guess they would call mm -hmm. me an instructor because I don't have a PhD. Um, but we, we put, we put this in completely different terms in our, okay. um, podcast, which is interesting mm -hmm. because you're, you're thinking about it from kind of like the academic frame, um, which is, it seems like the, the priorities there are different. Like it's, is, is it more technically focused kind of in the, because it's kind of like a spectrum, like there's like business analysts on one side and then like, you know, mathematician, data, hardcore data scientists on the other side. I think most of my audience is kind of over in this quadrant here, closer to business analytics. But it sounds like the value of a portfolio is you build your own personal brand. Right. So th that, that's probably the, the biggest value set that, that I see from building, building out a portfolio. Um, mm -hmm. and do you have any advice on how to approach building out a portfolio? Like, like what's your thought process and mm -hmm. this is what I want to include, or this, these are the projects that are on my future roadmap. Right. Like for my portfolio. So like, for example, my GitHub profile, uh, I have one for my research group and all of the projects that are included there are solely coming from research publications that I have produced. So a research paper will have one repository and within the repository, I would have like the data set and also the corresponding code in order to allow the reader to reproduce all of the figure and tables in, in described in the paper. And so what to include in the portfolio, like for, personally for me, one repository would equal to one research paper. And as you can see, each paper is based on original data set. So typically we would compile our own. We would scour the internet and 
either automatically uh, via web scraping or uh, manually reading the paper, extracting manually from the tables of the papers. And I mean, nowadays I saw that you could use natural language processing computer vision in order to automatically program it to scrape data numerical value from tables, from PDF files. Oh, and so cool. I, I might explore that for the future as well. But before we would do it manually. Yeah, so the, the PhD student would manually open up the PDF, copy, paste the, the numerical value into a tabular uh, spreadsheet in Microsoft Excel and repeatedly do, doing that for the next couple of months in order to amass a big data set. Oh, so wow. after that, yeah. So uh, there was one project where we spent half a year um, compiling data from uh, like thousands of research papers. Yeah. I had no idea. I thought that <laughs> you guys basically had like this big data source out in the academic world. Because this is something there that are. I'm like, kind of getting yeah, yeah. into just okay. now. Um, right, right. And just kind of seeing how, because it's interesting because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm at a university. So I right. university is probably 5,000 students in Greensboro College is I think around 1,000. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting to see very few different experiences because you're, you're, the college or university that you're at is probably huge, right? Um, I think it's about 35,000 students. Like we wow. have four campuses. Yeah. I'm, oh, wow. I'm just in like the, uh, in the major campus, the main campus. Yeah. But we're okay. remote. We're more remote, less traffic there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So about so, 15,000 there. Yeah. So what so what you're telling me though from from a portfolio standpoint kind of in your research group is it it's dictated by the research that who chooses to do that is it you are you leading yeah. that group yeah i'm leading the group okay um so do you have any advice on those who want because when i think of portfolio i don't think about work that i've actually done and gotten paid for because okay. When I'm working with a client, I can't show the, their financial data. Right. So right. you guys actually kind of have an advantage in a way in that this is already public facing data. It is, yeah. So actually one, one of the um, kind of concepts that we're developing on the podcast is, is advising people who are connected to nonprofits or know someone to mm -hmm. start visualizing nonprofit data. Because okay. um, one of the things that nonprofits are now competing on is they need to figure out how to quantify the impact they're having in local communities or whatever mm -hmm. their mission statement is. So that's where I think data visualization can come in key. So you find a way to collect the data, put it into a Tableau or a Power BI visualization, and then that organization can take that to their funders and potentially ask for more right. money. Ah, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. would definitely provide a lot of value to the companies as well. Because like, for example, if they, they have never explored using data analytics before, um, I mean, that could go a long way in helping them to see the importance of data analytics. And maybe in the future, they would implement their own team uh, in their company. Yeah. The nonprofit spaces, have you done any volunteering or been, are you actively involved in any nonprofits? Um, well, we're, we're doing semi, it's, it's kind of like this, that we're collaborating with other research groups. So I, I would say it's similar to, to nonprofit because we're not paid for that. And so like we're contributing our expertise in machine learning and we're at, and, and they're, they're providing, like we have a collaborator who's like coming from a biological setting. So they have biological data and they've not never done any like machine learning before. So we would take their data, analyze it, build a model, visualize it. And then we would create joint research publication together. Okay. Yeah. So my experience, so I've been the treasurer for a local nonprofit for the past two years. Mm -hmm. And my experience has been that most of the people who get involved in the nonprofit space are data phobic or financial. Okay. Like they, they do not want to handle data. They want to go and oh. make a big impact out in the world. It sounds mm -hmm. like the nonprofits that you're working with are probably an exception to that rule in that they are studying what bioinformatics, how do you say it, bioinformatic data? Bi bioinformatics is like what we would do, how, how we're applying informatics solution to analyze biological data. And so like our collaborator would be like biologist. Okay. So those people are, are probably much more into data. The nonprofit that I'm a, a, the treasurer for, 
they, their mission statement is their economic empowerment. So they, mm -hmm. it's called Tribe Local First. And what they do is they advocate for small business owners. So like think mom and pop shops, which mm -hmm. are actually being just wiped out right now due to COVID mm -hmm. because, you know, people, people's livelihoods, like they, they can't mm -hmm. go out of, they can't just pause their business for six months or nine right. months or however long we've been locked up for. Mm -hmm. So the, the job of the nonprofit that, I, that I'm with is to help these struggling small businesses kind of you know, hold on and hopefully grow and become, you know, a medium or even a large size business. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that I'm kind of around in that nonprofit are not, they're, they're not very focused on data. They want to go and just like do good work and help people. That's where mm -hmm. I'm seeing a huge opportunity in the nonprofit space is mm -hmm. that if you like, I, lo I love the idea that you were saying you can build a portfolio that's kind of philanthropic and can like solve a problem or, help or do some form of greater good right. i think that getting kind of combining your data science or data analytic skills with some nonprofit work does mm -hmm. two things so it can help you build your portfolio but also i mean it makes you feel good and it's right, also right. Exactly. helps people out yeah, yeah. so it's you kind of like you're you're contributing to more understanding of biology and in doing so, that might lead to new therapeutic. It might lead to new technological advancement for improving uh, the quality of life. And so just the sense of doing that, I mean, it, it kind of empowers you and it kind of drives you to do more. And actually, you asked one question, like, there is a lot of data available and why bother collecting your own data, right? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, because the thing is, we were driven by our own hypothesis. So our research question kind of drove us to collect the data because none are available in the curated form. I mean, sure, there are data available, you could download it, but then the data is very dirty. There's a lot of missing values. There's a lot of redundancy. And, and, and most of the time, they're not even in the database. So if that's the situation, I mean, eventually it will be deposited in the database because um, there are companies, uh, like for example, the European Bioinformatic Institute based in the UK, their, their institute is focused on collecting biological data and they rely on like a small team of human curator team. So they would essentially collect the data uh, like automatically or semi-automatically using like nat uh, language processing and then eventually they would include it into the database, but that would take time. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, because time is of the essence. And in research, the first to publish will have a, a competitive edge. And so, like, for example, at any given point in time, whatever idea that you have, like, you can expect to see it published in the next three to six months. And so everything is about, like, time, using time efficiently. Like... For example, I would have several projects, ideas, and then um, if I didn't get to have the opportunity to work on them, in the next three to six months, I would see something related published. And so the novelty of the, the idea that original had would not be original because someone has already published that. Oh, wow. That's so pressure. Kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like time pressure and trying to create some innovation, uh, like a gap in knowledge. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you're, you're surveying, you're using analytics to survey the entire data landscape. And then you hover and then like, imagine you're, you're like, you're a bird, you're flying <laughs> over the air and then you, you observe that, okay, there's food right there. And it's like, there will be other birds trying to, you know, aim Get for that the same, same food. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's kind of like that, but, but still it's, it's good. I mean, it's good, like good competition. Um, right, right. I mean, because it's for the better good. Yeah. So whoever reaches there first, that's good. But uh, like it would then be like, like for academic promotion reason as well. And also for uh, PhD students in order for them to get published because publishing is becoming increasingly difficult. And so we have to find something innovative, some unique selling point in the work in order to get published. Yeah. So there's other reason aside from analyzing like students have to get their degree have to do their thesis yeah okay Th this is really interesting because I, I feel like you're helping me fill a gap in my audience because most of the people that that we're talking to 
have very little technical skill and they're, they're looking, for example, they're looking to go from a marketing job to a marketing analytics job. So okay. I, I'm kind of like hitting them early on in that process. It mm -hmm. sounds like the people you, you deal with day in and day out are like PhD students. So they are, they are, are like, what is it? Uh, a mile, a mile deep and an inch wide, like they are so focused. Yeah, yeah, on I'm one, a small niche. Yeah, on yeah. One, yeah, one specific thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess I, I just don't, I don't want the people who are like, I don't want to get a PhD. What, what, give me some advice. <clears throat> Do you have any advice for those who are not going to be doing any academic research? Uh, you mentioned GitHub, and I know that a lot yeah. of people are building out portfolios on GitHub. Do mm -hmm. you, do you have any I don't know, I guess exposure to people who are doing kind of like their own pet projects. For example, mm -hmm. my, one of my students is a golf, a golfer on the golf team, yeah. and he mm -hmm. is collecting his own data and he turned that into a tableau visualization. Oh, Do you have any other, awesome. any other project examples like that? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. So that goes to the second question. I, I have it listed here. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, I, I have like two sections here. So find or prepare your own unique data set. So the first one, finding data set. So I, I made a video about finding unique data set from Tidy Tuesday. So okay. that is available from the R for data science community. So essentially every Tuesday, they would release a new data set for you to practice and play around with. And so they have a very active community. Mm -hmm. And so that would be pretty cool for any aspiring data scientist or uh, data analytics to, to get a new data to explore maybe use Tableau to explore the, the new data because the, the great thing about the, this is that because the data is released like every Tuesday, so there will not be a lot of other similar work in existence. Yeah, so it's something new. So it's something to stand apart from, uh, set yourself apart from the uh, other, other um, people. Like for example, if you're getting data sets from Kaggle, like open data set, like Titanic data set. I mean, there'd be countless other right. people analyzing the same data set. And so it's good for learning, but then in order to build a portfolio, you want to build it based on unique data set in order to stand unique apart from the other uh, candidate. And so aside from Tidy Tuesday, um, the second one that I have would be to, if, if the person is a bit tech savvy, um, they could make use of the API um, application programming interface. So all of the major databases that provides data, like websites that provide weather data, uh, they would have an API. Even Twitter has an API. YouTube has an API. So you could access the data directly from the API. And normally they would have it from their own uh, library, like for example, in Python. Uh, I made a couple of tutorials showing the use of API from the Yahoo Finance. So you could get access to stocks data from the Y Finance library. So that's very fairly um, uh, straightforward to use. Like, but some platform, they don't have any, any API. Like for example, LinkedIn, let's say you want to script data, right? From like the job postings. Yeah. So you, you might need to read the, the, the rules and regulation carefully, like whether they allow any form of web scraping. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so there's also an ethical issue to be aware of when like scraping. Actually, that, that is the second part that I want to, uh, to go to. Um, but before finishing off the finding the data set, there are public and open data set available. Like many, many countries have open data set, like Thailand has an open data website. Uh, in the U.S., yeah, in the U.S., there are open data set. Like, for example, you could have access to uh, police officers' data, right? They, they, oh, they show the it. name of the police officer, like the, the number of arrests and et cetera. Um, yeah, so all of these data are open. I mean, if, if you try to search open data, you're, you're fine a lot. Um, and there's also a lot of open data in drug discovery as well, which is the area that I'm doing. Um, the fourth source that you could get new data is from the scientific journals. And 
traditionally scientific journal or, or research papers, they would share their data in the supplementary section. So they would report a new finding. Like for example, if someone published in Nature, they would report like, for example, global warming in Thailand, for example, I, I'm making this up. Mm -hmm. And then they will have the corresponding data in the supplementary section. So you could go ahead and oh, download okay. it. Yeah. So I'm sure there will be very few people analyzing it aside from the, the group publishing it um, because it requires you to, to find it a bit. I mean, if it's easy to find, like if it's an on Kaggle or um, like easily accessible, then you will have a lot of other people using the same data set. So yeah, so uh, in recent years, they have released some data centric journals so the journals are specifically focused on sharing data. And I have a couple of lists here, um, scientific data. I mean, the journal is called scientific data. Another one is called data in brief. Another is simply data, <laughs> data from MDPI. Yeah, so they, they have like one word. So, you, so these, these are a bunch of links. Could you leave a comment on the YouTube video when this pu publishes so that people can just Right. You know, go down click to your comment, it. click on it. And also, if you're clicking on that, go ahead and like that comment. <laughs> Helps the algorithm. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Let me get to the second point, which is to prepare your own data. So you want to create your own unique data set. Uh, well, you could do web scraping, right? You could use Beautiful Soup and Selenium in Python in order to scrape data from the internet. Um, another one would be to use... I've done some tutorial. You could use a one-liner code to use pandas in Python to script the whole data set from the website very easily using one line of code. Um, actually, oh, two wow. lines of code. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've, I've done some simple web scraping of the NBA data, basketball data, and also a recent tutorial on the S&P 500 uh, stock list. And I could provide the links to that as well. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, well, right. I know a couple of my students. So what's interesting about Greensboro College is that it's so small that a, like, I don't know, maybe 75% of the students are student athletes. Wow. So I have seven people in my analytics minor cohort, and I think that six of them are student athletes. Mm -hmm. So they would love to like get their hands on some, some bigger sports data because they have their... What, what we did in class was we downloaded uh, a PDF file from the Greensboro College website, and then okay. Tableau can connect directly to a PDF and then turn it into uh, this. Wow. Oh, that actually might be something for you to look into. Um, like if you, if you ever wanted to do like a quick turnaround, right. um, if you're, you said you, got, you often had PDFs, right? Right, right, right. Um, I'm wondering if the, there's, a, there's a, an option you can click to, called interpret data. Like when mm -hmm. you load the data up, it may be able to use some AI to like automatically pull that out. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have to definitely explore that. Interesting. So, um, yeah. so what, what were you saying? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I might even explore that. Like, not sure if Tableau has an interface to Python. So maybe somehow we could automate that as well. I know that like Power BI does. Bet that. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've never used it before. Yeah, so I'll definitely give it a try. I've tried Tableau once. Yeah. Well, well you keep talking about coding and it's like um, way <laughs> over my head. I mean, because yeah. I, whenever I have a consulting engagement where coding is required, right. I, just, I just bring in a subcontractor who's a data scientist. Mm. So oh, okay. I'm like a little bit worried that we're going to get out of my kind of comfort zone. <laughs> and All right, no, no problem, no problem. Like, yeah, because like, like I've also started from a non-technical background and so like zero programming. Um, so, so that took me like, I think more than five years. I actually started to learn coding. I started with C programming. Um, like I made a video talking about this as well. I started back when I was like an undergrad. I bought a book by Bjorn uh, Sostrup, like, the, uh, like a blue book about C programming. And so okay. I, that didn't click. And so it took me several years until I actually uh, clicked into programming. Uh, the second approach, would, I mean, the second time was trying to understand Java. And then the third time was Python. So, uh, for, so from the beginning to Python, that took about five years, but, but not like continuously, like kind of like trying to explore it for like a week. And then when it didn't make sense to me, I, I just moved on. 
yeah. So it, it took some time to actually break into uh, programming. Yeah. Okay. Maybe a boot camp would help. Oh, I've heard those yeah. are so controversial, though. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, haven't you seen all the YouTube or videos? a workshop? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. A workshop. I mean, yeah. I guess we don't have or to go down Or a university workshop. <laughs> yeah, I guess we don't have to go down that. Um, but right, I mean, right, right. you see those videos all the time on YouTube, right? I've of seen, like, yeah, yeah. Of like exactly. boot camp, scam, which right, I think right, some of right. them are, some of them aren't, is oh, kind okay. of consistent consensus i've seen from watching those videos but uh -huh. i do kind of have an interesting kind of framework for a conversation and let's let's close out this um because it's it's 10 p.m here i'm, I'm starting to get okay okay yeah yeah tired yeah. Um, okay so what i'm gathering from what you're saying is it's two things which i guess i'm gonna have to like kind of pull this concept out so you mentioned that it has to be unique and it mm -hmm. also has to be um, like solving a problem. Like it has to have some tactical acumen, which I don't know where I read this, but that's kind of like the, the way you can validate whether it's a good business idea, like for a startup. Is it mm -hmm. novel and is it valuable? That's what mm -hmm. you should invest your time in. Mm -hmm. Would you ascertain that that's a good way to approach your portfolio? Yeah, so being novel would make you your portfolio stand out from the crowd like for example if the employer or the reviewer is looking through like hundreds of portfolios and let's say all of them are using similar data set and let's say you're using something about like maybe you're analyzing your own spotify uh usage data or your own netflix uh viewing uh, data and then you're trying to make, and then you, you have like this good communication skill where you're analyzing it, you're communicating it, you're displaying it with like awesome uh, data visualization. And so that would add value to your work. And so I, I think that the uniqueness of the data would just make it stand out. Mm -hmm. But in order to solidify that in, into the minds of the reviewer would be the, the communication skill that you have in conveying the the results. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I feel like you just kind of put a pin in it. So those of you who are listening either on YouTube or out on the podcast world, thank you for tuning in. And Janine, I, this was, this was awesome. I feel like you're so much more technically in depth than I am, but it's really interesting kind of seeing like the world that you're in and also kind of like the technical skills that, that you just that can just rattle off. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure.